Good evening, and welcome to the second season of Vanguard, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. Vanguard started, or Vanguard STEM for short. Vanguard started out as a conversation to engage in merging and establish women of color in STEM all over the country and all over the world um, as they were going through their journey and figuring out what they want to do. Um, we had our first season last season, uh, starting in July. If you want to see that season, you can uh, YouTube it. We're on YouTube. All of our episodes are archived. Um, and we'll be starting the new season today. Now, we're doing a special episode about the Flint water crisis. And this arose because many people are talking about the Flint water crisis and uh, the, the way in which people have, have been exposed to contaminated water and how they have been trying to fight through and, and get better, safer water. I was thinking as an astrophysicist about just the science behind it and what is happening truly with the water, what's happening with the pipes, what's happening in the understory to really try to get to um, the core of the matter, uh, given that it is affecting people. So let me tell you who I am and then tell you about my panelists. Uh, my name is Jedida Eisler. I am an astrophysicist by training, and I am the host of Vanguard STEM. And I am bringing to you an incredible panel of experts on uh, environmental engineering, on water, on epidemiology, to, to try to bring to bear the story and the science of uh, what's happening in the Flint water study. Flint water crisis. So that's the conversation we're going to have today. So without further ado, Please let me introduce you to our esteemed panelists. First up is Dr. Melanie Harrison Okoro. She is an environmental engineer and she works on water quality and invasive species. Next up, we have Dr. Joyce Ball Ferry, who works on psychiatric epidemiology. We also have uh, Siddhartha Roy, who is one of the researchers at Virginia Tech and is the communications manager for the Flint Water Study. We have another panelist who we're going to try to get on with us soon, so we'll hopefully have him through the show. His name is Jason Johnson. So I wanted to, for each one of them to just give a quick overview of their area of expertise and the work that they do before we jump into the major subject. Finally, before we do that, let me just say that I am purposely not mentioning um, any particular affiliation apart from Virginia Tech because we're speaking with our experts tonight based on their scientific expertise. They represent themselves and the knowledge that they've gained through experience, um, and they are not speaking for their affiliation. So while they work for federal agencies and for major clinics and major labs, um, they're speaking tonight from their scientific expertise, so we're, we're very appreciative of them. So let's start maybe on my left with uh, Joy. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe give us a minute or two, tell us about who you are. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you so much um, for including me in the panel. I really do appreciate the opportunity to, um, to speak with everyone today. Uh, my name is Dr. Joyce Balsberry, or Joy. Um, I am a psychiatric, psychiatric epidemiologist and health educator. Um, my primary research focuses on the um, engagement of different stakeholders and communities in terms of thinking about increasing health equity and um, alleviating health disparities in most hard to reach communities. Um, I've been in the field now for as an epidemiologist for about 17 years um, and I've been working for a bit around the country as well as abroad um, studying different uh, diseases um, from chronic health conditions as well as comorbid health conditions linked to infectious disease. Um, so I'm really delighted to be included on the panel today. Thank you. Melanie, we'll go with you next. My name is Dr. Melanie Harrison Okoro. Uh, my background is in water quality. Um, I would say that I'm an engineer, but I'm not. I'm actually an environmental scientist. And so um, I have uh, quite a bit of experience uh, looking at the impacts of pollutants, uh, contaminants in particular, nutrients, as well as uh, methylmercury and the impacts to aquatic environments. And really looking at the fate and transport of those contaminants as they move through the system, uh, as they bioaccumulate in aquatic organisms, and uh, what the relative impacts are to uh, our natural resources, such as water. And Siddhartha? 
Sure. Uh, my name is Siddhartha Roy. I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. I work with Dr. Mark Edwards. Uh, before the Flint water crisis, I looked at flow-induced failures or what's called erosion corrosion in plumbing systems. So specifically, I'd look at how, why do copper and you know brass fittings sometimes fail in buildings and what water chemistry factors could be responsible for that. But since Flint happened, I think I've dedicated the last six months of my life, all my nights, all my weekends on this. So I'm really glad that I, I could be here and talk about what's going on there. We're very excited to have all three of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think, Siddhartha, we'll start with you, uh, given that you are on the ground. When you and I talked before, I mentioned that one of the things that was stunning and incredible to me and really a light in so much darkness in this situation is how incredibly well science was used to expose this problem, right? That your team was able to amass 300 test kits or send out 300 test kits and get back something like 85%, right? That it's an incredible example of citizen science, which is not something that is, is typically sort of what we associate with how we solve these kinds of problems. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you all got involved and then how you went about setting up the framework for how to get out and really start to point out that this is not an individual personal pipes problem, but it was a larger systemic mm -hmm. problem. So initially we got involved because a Flint resident, Leanne Walters, who I'm sure many of you have heard about, uh, she was getting her water tested by the city and she found, they found very high levels of lead in the hundreds in her water. and but they would not give her any more answers. And later she even found out that one of her kids had been lead poisoned. Uh, so looking for answers and not getting any help from the city, she contacted this EPA scientist, Miguel Del Toro, who is one of the foremost lead experts in the country. You know, this amazing woman, you know, just a single, just a mother looking for answers uh, in terms of Make, trying to make sure her kids' health is protected. So Miguel took a personal interest in her story and actually came up to Flint and uh, he helped coordinate with us a sampling effort in her home in April. So we tested her uh, tap water and we took, I, I believe, like 30 samples. Uh, so just for some context, there is no safe level of lead in drinking water but the EPA action level is 1515 parts per billion. So when Leanne and you know Miguel and us, we coordinate the sampling, the average of her uh, home tap water was 2,000 parts per billion. Wow. It, this is astronomically high. And the highest uh, lead sample was 13,200. We could not believe that these lead levels could be coming out of somebody's tap. So Miguel took this data, and also he was corresponding with the state DEQ of, uh, in Michigan, looking for answers if you know Flint was actually practicing federal protocol in terms of corrosion control. I can talk about that later. But he found out, based on his scientific expertise, that uh, because Flint was not practicing corrosion control, and Flint, like many old cities in the US, has a lot of lead pipes, there was a big chance that this was a widespread problem. So Miguel took all this information and wrote a memo in June and sent it out to state and federal employees. And the hope was, despite citizens already being on this water for more than a year, uh, the data and the, and the information in this memo would be used for solving this problem as soon as possible. But here's what happened. Uh, Miguel's memo uh, got leaked in, into the media, and when people in the state and federal government were asked about it, they said, you know, this is just a draft. And then he was handled. He wasn't allowed to talk to the media. And p people just told the citizens of Flint that you can relax. Uh, the water is meeting all state and federal drinking st standards. So, so at that point, this, I mean, all these residents who had been protesting for months looking for answers uh, and their own state uh, officials are telling them that you guys are wrong and the water is safe, so please stop doing this. Um, and we got a call from Leanne in, in early August. She was very troubled and, and she went, you know, we, I don't think something's going to happen. So at that point, uh, we decided, you know, this was the morally right thing to do. We were a lab that was uniquely positioned in terms of the expertise and had some funding and maybe could pull off something unprecedented. So uh, that's how uh, we began uh, this, this journey uh, that you now that is now national news. Right. 
Right, and so I want to back up just a little bit since we are, thank you so much for, for reviewing and, and setting the context because I think there's so much there already that needs to be discussed. Yes, Leanne Walters is clearly just an amazing woman um, doing incredible sort of act activism still uh, on the ground today doing work even though she's not necessarily in Flint. So I wanted to back up and 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 get to some, some details about things that you said about, for example, um, there's no safe uh, level of lead in the water and the units of measure that we're using here. So um, we talk about you know 15 parts per billion is when this, federally someone has to say something and hers were at 13,200. So I wanted to ask Melanie if you could tell us, sort of explain to us um, what that means in terms of like something we can process. What does it mean to have, you know, what is parts per billion at all and then what does it mean to have such a huge difference in what that measurement is in terms of water quality. So <clears throat> what I will say is that the EPA action level limits. So it is essentially a trigger in which once a level is exceeded, uh, then that particular agency that has the oversight uh, in this particular case, it would have either been uh, the uh, city of Flint or uh, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, these levels are initially set by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so SIDHARTA is, is correct. The EPA uh, would like to see no lead uh, in its drinking water supply. Uh, and however, their lead does get into your supply, and so there is a trigger action level of 15 parts per billion. Uh, even a very, which means even a very minute, small level of lead can be harmful. And in particular, in this case, uh, for lead as a toxic, uh, it impacts the most vulnerable uh, population, that being children, infant, as well as pregnant women. And so I want to back up just a little bit and talk about, if you don't mind, the oversight and where that comes into play. Sure. Why don't, why don't we start, start with that? Sure. So the Environmental Protection Agency is the agency responsible for jurisdiction over uh, and uh, the public water drinking supply. And so <clears throat> in this case, they've given that authority to uh, treat the water to the uh, State Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, the state uh, then is the oversight agency for uh, Flint, the city of Flint uh, treatment system. And it, is, it can be a, a pretty complex process. Uh, but in this case, the state then provides the oversight for the city of Flint. Flint, the city of Flint, then develops a, a treatment plan for its water source. And that uh, plan is passed back to the Department of Environmental Quality for review. Uh, that review is then signed off on and case studies or pilot studies are undergone, undertaken so that the appropriate treatment uh, can be used. And then uh, the process continues where uh, the treatment might be implemented, uh, various treatment types, and then uh, once that treatment type is implemented, monitoring continues to happen to make sure that that treatment is effective and if there needs to be adjustments or changes in the system. And so it can be a, a, a pretty complex uh, process, but one where there are checks and balances, uh, supposedly checks and balances at, at each level, federal, state, as well as local government. Right, and, and I think you know part of what uh, Siddhartha was getting at is, is that, that it seems like those checks and balances weren't followed or adhered to. I don't want to get too far down that road just because that's not the area of our expertise. Um, I, I wanted to, though, touch back on what you said about its impact on the most vulnerable communities. And here I would like to bring in uh, Joy to ask the question about that, right? So, you know, on the one hand, you had the, the Virginia Tech team, you had Leanne Walters on the ground, you had, you know, the this is what the measurement is in my house, and it is stunning. It is, it is appalling. Um, but then on, on the other hand, you know, you had uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, right, doing the sort of epidemiological work 
on the other side and saying, well, since the water supply has been switched, we've seen an incredible rise in the occurrence of lead poisoning in the community. And so I wonder, Joy, if you could talk to us a little bit about how she might have done that study in terms of like gathering materials, analyzing those materials, and then figuring out where indeed the problem was. Okay. So a lot of times with epidemiologists, you know, we will start, you know, I consider us disease detectives to an extent. You know, we will start off by saying, okay, we see something is happening in a community and we want to look at where the outbreak or the occurrence of a disease might take place. So for this for this time, it's looking at the rise in lead poisoning and the rise in even things related to the different bacteria that were in the water and even, um, and I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but um, Leganelle's disease as well. So it's Legionnaire's disease. Thank you. Okay. You know, see that, that the beauty of being dyslexic, I can pronounce words wrong and then ask somebody else to help me. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, thinking about, you know, what she was probably seeing, there were probably more cases of kids getting sick with lead poisoning and things like that. And then that triggers a response from the health department to say, okay, we need to start investigating this to figure out where is this happening? What are the hot, what they call hot spots? So where is this really happening in our community? Where is it concentrated? And what do we need to do about that? And so a lot of times it'll start with looking at health medical records and doing medical record abstraction, looking at people that are calling into the health department with problems, and also even talking to healthcare providers, and then even um, going into homes and testing the water quality of those homes and talking to the residents. Now, so on the flip side of it, as an epidemiologist, we put all of this wonderful data that we gather into databases and then we run statistics and we look at the things of the incidence of the disease, so how many people actually have it, where is it concentrated, and then what do we need to do about it. But the, on the flip side of it, we can make a plan but what really helps that plan to move forward is thinking about the stakeholders that are impacted by that disease or that condition. In this case, it's the lead poisoning. So when you have people that come out like from the community, like Lena, um, you have the scientists and you have the health department working together to address the health concern, then you end up become, coming up with what they call a community action plan. So as epidemiologists, we love it when the community is actively involved in disease investigation because they know what's going on in their homes. They are the voice of what's happening around them. And sometimes, you know, we don't always see things that can actually make the change occur in terms of making people healthy. So by the, the woman, um, Lena called, Ms. Lena calling and saying, okay, there's a problem. The epidemiologist is, you know, noticing the problem and the two coming together and say, okay, we need to do something about this. I think helped um, the researchers in Virginia to even have a strong case of actually going into the community to make the change occur. Yeah, yeah, and actually, I, that's a really good point about you know people knowing what's going on in their homes, and I want to circle back, Siddhartha, to you and talk about how you know we, we talked about how so sophisticated and savvy the citizens were who were doing the testing and how they helped inform that testing. So could you answer two questions for me? The first is um, how you got it fanned out into all the wards so that you got testing from everywhere, and then two, could you talk to us a little bit about how the, the residents of Flint really made clear that they know what's going on with their water and how they got those tests back to you and how they became active participants in the scientific process. Uh, I'll get to that. Just to back up a little bit, when the Ramona Hanna Tishak, uh, you know, posted her results, uh, there were a clear comparison of all the uh, cases that Hurley Medical Center had of kids being let poisoned before the water switch and after the water switch. Mm -hmm. So they had a very sample, a very big sample size that they could compare and then say specifically that in fact uh, the in the city of Flint kids uh, with lead poisoning had doubled and in the zip codes where we found high levels of lead in the water. Uh, 
the zip codes, the levels of blood lead in kids had, had actually tripled. So mm -hmm. initially, the state actually was against her results, stating that oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about, and our results don't don't actually match with hers. But when you look closely at the state's own analysis. Uh, they actually found that there was a spike. So I think, as uh, as a society, when we look when we have health departments with with all these experts, we would hope that they would look at their data a lot more carefully before you know going on a public stage and making this announcement. Now, to answer your question, uh, it was fantastic uh, when we had this initial goal of you know reaching 300. We put out 300 lead kits. Our hope was even if a quarter came back, maybe 75 out of a 300. Uh, that's more than the city sampled in six months. The city yeah. samples 69 homes in their official records. Uh, and we were like, even if 75 came back, you know, we would conclusively able to see, say if there is a lead problem. Because according to Miguel's memo and everything that we knew at that point, that Flint uh, had a very corrosive water source and it was not practicing corrosion control. This was a perfect storm of, you know, Flint had water problems right yeah. after they switched. So they had bacteria problems. Then they had high levels of disinfection byproducts. Uh, you know, then they had iron issues because iron mains was were bursting and the water was orange and brown. And so people knew that there was a widespread water problem for months. Uh, and when they were looking for answers, and when we coordinated with them, there was already a growing coalition of people excuse me, who were actually interested in working days and nights in making sure we got the data. So we sent out 300 lead kits and we had these amazing group of pa pastors called, called the Concerned Pastor for Social Action. Then this group of, of, by Leanne and Melissa Mays called What Are You Fighting For? Another group called uh, D Democracy Defense League. All these citizen groups, you know, the ACLU of Michigan, uh, we sent out 300 kits and within within a week, kids started coming back. You know, these people would drive to all parts of the city, coordinate on social media, asking if people wanted to get their water tested. Uh, so, and they would drive just at the at one. You know, if they got a phone call, they would get a kid and drive to that place, give this person the kid, make sure they watch the video that we made of how to sample the water, which is according to EPA protocol, which is fantastic. You know, they made sure that when citizens did their science, it was as accurate and as well done as actual scientists would do. And in about a month, we had over 270 kits back. That is more than a 90% return rate. So it, this was unprecedented in citizens looking for answers and actually you know, doing their part as soon as possible. And we would, on our part, analyze them on, on the weekends as soon as we could uh, and actually call these the people where we found highlights so that people could take steps to protect themselves. So it was this collaboration of you know concerned citizens and scientists willing to help them that kind of pulled this off. So you have to give credit where it's due, and in this case, it's the amazing citizen scientists who actually defied what the state was saying. So this is one example. The, the state told us and in the media that it is so hard to get people to actually comply and you know get their water tested. So we t we got uh, I mean more kits in six weeks, four times more kits in six weeks than these people did in six months. That says something. People are concerned about what's in their drinking water and they want answers. If you make a conversation, if you try to help them and actually work with them, they will work with you. And that is what happened in Flint with us. Yeah, you know, and that gets at the core of why I think this conversation is important because we often, as a society, think about science separately from life, right? Those of us who do science are over off in some corner, or they like to call it the ivory tower, right? We're over here squirreling away doing things. Um, and then the rest of the world is overdoing some other things. And this, it's a tragedy. And I am, I would never wish anything like this on anyone. But I think this tragedy showed what you just said, right? That like people are committed to, first of all, people care. Second of all, they're committed to their themselves and their communities and their families and their children. And they want to see those constituents taken care of and they're willing to do whatever is necessary. And, and so this idea of citizen science as a social justice mechanism, I think, is really being sorely underreported, right? As you said, people were sending things back. If you know if you got them within the week, then they were literally like as soon as they got the kits, they were 
putting them under the flow and then sending them back to you. I think that's a really um, important and, and really critical. It's a critical piece of the of, of the unfolding scenario, right? Um, and so I wonder. And I guess the other thing I wanted to to, to mention there is that the video. I watched the video that you all put out, and you know, read I've read the the website. It's FlintWaterStudy dot org. Yes. Or, um, where all of these, if you want to know anything about um, the research that the that Mark Edwards and his Virginia Tech crew have done, it's all there and it's open and available to the public. So you know, I, I think about how powerful it is to have a video where it's like this is how the test is done. You put your you know containers under the water and you and it, you walk through the whole process. Um, so so I, I really we're going to come back to that point because I think it's a critical one to the conversation. Uh, Melanie, I wanted to ask you a quick question, um, and really anyone. This is open to anyone. Um, I thought when this the story was unfolding that seeing the iron and having the iron have a, a particular uh, color and sort of odor that you could see and, and interpret was was probably helpful because lead is not has no taste, no color, no whatever. And so I wonder if it would have if seeing the iron having those like more visible engaged contaminants made it um, set off an alarm better or faster than if it had just been um, let itself. I'd, I'd love to hear thoughts about that. You're absolutely right. Uh, visually seeing uh, the changes in your water integrity, uh, is particularly when the water is a rust color or it's turbid or there's an odor or smell to it, um, I, I think would trigger anyone to say, you know, there's something going on here. Uh, the, the, the problem with lettuce is odorless, it's tasteless, and it's colorless. And, you know, really the only way uh, that you'd be able to uh, detect whether you had what lead in your system uh, is through, one, either testing that source water, so that water that's coming from the Flint River, and then testing what's actually coming out of your treatment system. So what's in those service pipes or your distribution uh, system. And, you know, right now, uh, thank goodness we have really good citizen science. I absolutely agree with you because... Uh, visually having that water uh, in front of uh, the folks that have the authority and 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 making sure that they see what's going on is something that you know you really can't ignore. I agree. I agree. Um, but, but it wasn't enough. Uh, sorry, were you going to say something, no, John? No, please. I was going to ask you what you thought. <laughs> okay. No, but it wasn't enough in that you know. These problems began right after the switch. So mm -hmm. people had been getting this turbid, you know, you know, yellow, uh, you, it would be different colors on different days. So, and every time they would have a town hall meeting and citizens would show up with their jugs, you know, full of orange or green or blue water, uh, they would be, they would be, I mean, cast aside and people would say these, uh, these experts, if you will, who are on these councils and who are experts from the state DEQ would come up and tell them that everything's fine. It's, it meets state and federal standards and therefore it is safe to drink. Well, if you have a problem aesthetically to begin with, people are going to be put off by the water anyway. So it, it is possible that your water can look orange and it still can be safe to drink. But in case, in the case of Flint, uh, it was you're right because there were there was there were very high levels of chloride or salts in the water. That was why the iron corrosion was happening. Hence, you saw the color, and it was it was an alarm. So people did not know that was a problem. But in the case of you know, there have been cases of high lead release in other cities, where a switch in disinfection, for example. So in D.C., from 2001 to 2004. Uh, Washington DC in good intention they switched their disinfection by that I mean you add something like chlorine or chloramine to make sure bacteria die in your water system and it gets safe water so when they switched from chlorine to chloramine and high levels of, of lead were in DC's drinking water for over two and a half years and people did not know because the water looked safe it looked mm -hmm. fine and yet kids were like poisoned so mm -hmm. I agree in this case it was a good alarm but that doesn't always happen yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, the community engaged 
approach that was used with this project, you know, was pivotal. You know, when you think about the concerned action group and the what are we fighting for group. And then what I like to call, you know, not just the citizen scientists, but the community engaged citizen scientists speaking up and saying, okay, we're going to this town hall meeting. We need to do something about this. And for them to keep waving the flag and saying, hello, can you hear me? Also, I think, changed the perception. And then the fact that the media leak back in June of the memo, of Miguel's memo, also, I think, raised another alarm, not just the, the color of the water as well, because then people become social media savvy. Because despite geography, we now have this bigger community that we can engage with about dialogues, about STEM, about water quality, about safety and things like that, which brings into another dynamic of people saying, okay, on a national level, what can we do to help this community? Right, and I agree. I mean, social media has played such a pivotal role in all of this. Uh, in you know, if you look at how the citizens went about ensuring that they had 300 people to begin with, you know, no one knows 300 people in a, in, a, in a city, but they found people interested in different parts of the city who would be willing to test and get these results back. Uh, another example is when we were you know putting all these results out, people were doing, doing their own research and asking us questions, which helped better inform what we put on the website. So all our FAQs answering questions like, is the water safe to bathe in? Or when would be able to you would be able to say that the water is safe to drink? All of this on our website is actually informed by citizens. So what's going on here is this bi-directional approach of concerned mm -hmm. citizens on the ground asking important yeah. questions and scientists using their expertise and whatever they know in answering those. So this is something that you don't see very often because the public here is an equal partner. You know, we are not experts sitting on a high level just because we have a PhD. The the idea is. As engineers, as scientists, we hope to contribute to the public good, and that's why we should be using science. Uh, so Flint Water Study, everything is online, so people can access it. Uh, we wouldn't be getting any academic credit because you know we post all our data on the web, and so we cannot publish it, but that's fine. Uh, we are happy because this was the right thing to do, and that is how science should be looked at, and I think that's, that is what is often, often forgotten. Yeah, it, it brings to the point um, what they call dynamic engagement. It, you know, it allows for these bi-directional relationships and for dissemination of scientific findings to reach the community a lot sooner, which in this case is impacting overall wellness because the goal of all the things that we've been talking about is wellness and health. And so, you know, and just making sure that these women, these children, and these families are not impacted by something that's definitely preventable. And, you know, I think it's amazing that your response rate was 90%. That does not usually happen. I, you know, I think it's outstanding. And, and one thing I'd like to add is that the Flint water study is, is transparent, right? Right. It's, it's essentially open science, and that's where we're going. What will the open science allow us to do? It will, it can allow us to expand our study area, right? So what are the people that are affected? We can go out there and make correlations about uh, not only lead, but other contaminants that could be potentially found in the system. So open science becomes extremely important and, and engaging with the citizens in the science that they do, but also um, making sure that it's valid is extremely important as well and it, it's just been a, an incredible process to see uh, how Virginia Tech researchers have worked to make it open science but also valid science as well. Mm -hmm. I'll just add a, a brief example and I think you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, so Leanne, you know, back in August when we visited her home, we left a chlorine meter at her house uh, because of all the corrosion happening in the water distribution system. No chlorine was reaching, uh, you know, consumer taps, which is a cause of concern. So what we did was we left Leanne with this this chlorine meter, and every day she would sample her tap water and find zero chlorine, and she would send the result to us, and we would post it on the web. So for three weeks we had a timeline saying, oh, for 21 days we have no chlorine. Now uh, when I guess about 10 days back, Leanne was back in Flint and she was going around sampling homes looking at chlorine for us 
and she's now working with the EPA. So now six film crews are following her while she's sampling chlorine at people's homes. And I think it, this, and one thing happened, an EPA of, official was doing the chlorine sampling wrong. So Leanne had to teach this fellow how to sample, how to look at chlorine. That's so awesome. that just tells you, you know, what power open science can bring and empower citizens in, you know, doing things even better than conventional scientists. Oh, that, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, that is fantastic. And it, <laughs> it's so, like, you know, you, you're all, we're all agreeing on this notion of how important open science is and how important citizen science is and how important communication between scientists and citizens are, right? Like, all of these things are being underscored in these comments. Um, and I, I think about, but, but, but it's also not organic, right? What, the, what your lab has done, the, the Edwards Lab at Virginia Tech, y'all have been doing this a while. This was not something that you created for this particular um, tragedy, right? Like, this was something that you all have been working on for years and years at a time. As you mentioned, you know, Dr. Edwards had uh, engagement with the, with the D.C. water uh, lead poisoning 10 years ago, right? So, so this is something that y'all have been building over time, and I think it, that that bears repeating because, you know, we can all talk about how important it is, but we've got to be on our side, on the scientist side, proactive about creating an environment that's open and that can still create and produce valid science. And I think something, you know, you said, Siddharth, that I think we should also recognize is that there should be some scientific credit is not the right word in this case, but some recognition of how powerful this has been as an open science endeavor. Furthermore, the, the fact that the responses came so quickly and things happened so quickly really cut the knees out of the conversation about how, oh, it takes time, oh, it just we need to get people interested, it's going to take us years to get, no, it doesn't. If you find something that people can connect with, hopefully it's not because we're doing damage to them, that is absolutely not the way to create um, motivation around something, but like having something that resonates with, with, with individuals is a powerful tool for action. You know, and, and, and what I'm thinking about in terms of the young people in, in Flint and I know that the, the implications for lead are on that you can't correct them. They are there. They're not something that is just going to go away, which is in part the most devastating part of this story. But I also think, you know, they're, they're still young people. They still have an opportunity. And, and, and I, I think of them now as like the budding scientists that are going to go into sort of water quality and understanding, you know, like how to be – active and engaged, that they, they still um, possess the beauty and, and potential that all young people have. And I like going back to community engagement. I like the this initiative that Dr. Mona, Hannah, Atisha, and others at um, the medical centers are building around is like proactive cases of, okay, you've had this exposure. This has been horrific, and I can't believe it happened. But now what are we going to do to support the these, these young people and these families. It's not just the young people, but the families too. So, you know, I, I view it as a really interesting moment to, to not just treat them, but give them sort of a badge that says, no, you're, you can be an expert at this. You can continue to check. As you said, Leanne went back to check the water. Like, I just feel like there's an opportunity there to continue to engage the community with this, um, with this work. And, um, so, if anyone had any thoughts about about that, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, you know, it it really goes back to you know community coalition building, community engaged research principles. It goes back to building bidirectional relationships, which I really consider are multi-directional because it's not just only in your vacuum. It's like, okay, we've had this problem, so now what? And then what lessons learned can we have in order to be responsive and not reactionary when something else happens next? And then it also is motivating because now the citizens feel like they have a stake in the game and they're able to make change. And then with our young people, it gives them an opportunity just to look at alternative careers 
in science where they can be actively engaged in a process to change lives. And so it, it makes science, um, it brings science home. It allows us to really do a deeper dive in a way as scientists because then we're able to hear from people that we don't usually hear from. It gives a voice to the community. And I love the fact that, um, that the information is open source. It's right there. The dissemination plan is right there. And I would encourage um, our, my colleagues in Virginia to try to publish this because our scientific community needs to know about community engaged research. What does it mean and how it closes that translational science gap which sometimes takes anywhere from 17 to 25 years for it to reach the general public. And this is a really good example for that so that we need to ch challenge our peer scientists who are editors of journals to say okay yeah we know we got this website out here however we need to tell you what we did in order to change people's lives. Thinking about it. <laughs> I'm I, I, I am, I am I'm dead serious. And, and I'm Joyce, serious. I would definitely agree with you. Uh, there are many open source databases that are out there uh, with lots of information on water quality, um, but uh, the way that the information is summarized and put together for the public is something that um, oftentimes is, you know, that's valuable information that's just not used. And so, and so that information can be very powerful when you're talking about uh, leading future efforts in terms of monitoring, uh, but making sure that the information is out there, uh, not only in our journals, so you're absolutely correct, but in our, our, our popular magazine and our social media uh, so, that, so that folks can, can actually see uh, and visualize the data and in real time see what's actually going on on the ground. Yeah, exactly. right. Absolutely. So one of the questions I had, and we weren't able to get our um, infrastructure person on the phone, but one of the, the questions that sort of it sort of begs the question of what to do next, right? So the the water source would switch back to um, Lake Huron. Lake right. Huron. You know, the the anti corrosion. Um, chemicals have been put into the water, right? So the things that should have been done before have now been done, but to what end, right? So how do we go forward from here? Is it the case that that scientifically, as far as the the actual pipes are concerned, they are irreparable, and so they have to come scientifically, they should come out, or is it the case that the the coating will ultimately repair itself? Like what? kinds of scientific recourse do we have? Right. So, you know, you're absolutely correct. The damage done to the pipes is irreversible in that in 18 months, uh, the pipes have uh, aged more than they would have if it was, you know, flowing. Uh, it was having Lake Huron water for over a decade. So my point is they've aged more in 18 months than it, it would have taken it uh, if it had stayed, stayed on Lake Huron water for a decade. So, uh, but as now that they have anti-corrosion agents, what's called orthophosphates, these chemicals they, that they bind with the walls in the pipes and, and, you know, build this protective coating to minimize uh, lead coming off from the walls and into the water. So this is already starting to happen uh, as, we, as we speak. It has been three months since it switched back. So in the short term, our goal should be to ensure that when we do a comprehensive testing under the lead and copper rule, it is under federal compliance in that lead levels have actually dropped below 15 as mandated by the lead and copper rule. We can argue that the LCR is weak and we can, that's true because 10% of homes can have any amounts of lead and it can still be in compliance. But uh, we, we can also say that Flint would have the same level of protection that every other city in the U.S. has. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, Definitely, you should be investing in the in nutrition, health, public, you know, lifestyle services for the kids, for the families in Flint, and this has to go on for decades. Uh, in terms of water infrastructure, you're right. Uh, our water infrastructure is aging. Some pipes are even more than 100 years old. So, in terms of Flint, because uh, about half 
through the pipes and Flint are lead pipes. And as long as you have lead in the system, there is some chance that lead will come off. So in the long term, they should find the money of actually going about replacing the water infrastructure uh, and all these pipes. An overarching theme that I think is often overlooked, and it's not this time, is the question of trust. Mm -hmm. In that uh, Flint residents do not trust the state government, do not trust the filters that are being given out to them, do not trust what their city is saying. Because for 18 months they've been lied to, they've been served this poisonous water, which is which, which is unconscionable, it is inexcusable. So no one's going to trust what the governor says or what the state DEQ says. And I, and I say this often, and I'll say it again, that it's surprising that the only group they trust is a, is a bunch of 20-year-olds and a professor in Blacksburg, Virginia. So, <laughs> I mean, you have activists on the ground calling us, uh, asking us to put out statements that say that bathing is safe in this water and people can bathe. They wouldn't trust the activists working on the ground who are health experts, but if this message comes from us, people would listen to this. So uh, I think uh, the state and the city officials, everyone should do everything in their power in the next uh, months and the end years to regain that trust that they have rightfully lost. Yeah, I want to pivot to... Absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And you know, the issue of trust and community engagement implicit in, is, is implicit in this conversation about trust. I want to pivot to joy and talk about that, right? So you do community engaged work. There is, as Siddhartha mentioned, an incredible amount of damage done to the trust in this in these community in this community. And I think it extends a little further than that, but definitely um, to the to this community. So, given what you know about community engaged work in epidemiology, are there things that you can suggest that might be helpful along this line? You know, I think the first thing is acknowledging that mistakes were made. You know, a lot of times people don't like the wool being pulled over their eyes. And, you know, for 18 months, the officials knew something was going on and statements were being released to say, okay, this is safe, when they knew full well that it wasn't. So I think acknowledging the fact that mistakes were made is a big way of gaining trust. It's just like if a kid makes a mistake and they lie and say that, you know, that they didn't do something wrong and they know they did, then their parents lose trust in them. I think the other thing is looking at the norms of the community. You know, how does the community like to receive information? When do they like to receive information? Where do they like to receive information? And then showing up you know, the health officials showing up, the scientists showing up, the politicians showing up, the community activists showing up at those locations, the way that the community feels is, is important. Because again, we, we all have a way that we like to communicate and receive data. You know, I'm a data head. You know, as an epidemiologist, I like to look at data a certain way. There's popular magazines that I enjoy reading. There are websites that I go to. There are social media tools that I like to engage with. There's conversations that I like to have. And then what does that community need? How do they communicate? Is it via text message? Do they need a text alert? Is it systems like the Amber Alert system that's out for missing kids that, you know, that talks about water quality? Is it via website? Is it a town hall? But then also being willing to be honest, and if they don't know the answer to a question that a citizen asks, and, you know, being honest and saying, I don't know, but let's work together to find out the answer. I think that people appreciate that more than um, overshadowing what, what others might, you know, or sugarcoating it. You know, I think direct messages work, uh, dynamic engagement work, and then being willing to listen to what the community is saying. If the community is saying, okay, I'm seeing this in my home, you don't live in my home, but this is what's happening, and being willing to, to listen rather than saying, okay, no, that's fine, and, and, you know, letting that go, I think is another key. So listening to the community, being willing to have open dialogues, acknowledging mistakes, and then thinking about the best approaches for communicating um, with the community as well. Thank, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, I cannot emphasize enough how listening is critical in everything that we do, because if your water is, is looks red, and I'm telling you that, you should believe me because I'm living that experience and you, you're outside as a scientist, you're not listening to me, it wouldn't help either of us. But Another thing that I think uh, would also help is perspective. You know, we can look at Flint and 
realize it's a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity in how we rebuild the city, mm -hmm. how we rebuild the community. So all the communication tools we would use, all the, all the things we would put in place to regain trust, the big, big picture perspective should be we need to make sure the, the kids in the city, the families in the city have a bright future to look forward to and then work towards it. So having that perspective mm -hmm. often helps uh, people becoming optimistic and a lot more honest and not, and, and act, acknowledging sometimes if they don't know, they would say, I don't know. But this big picture perspective of let's work to rebuild Flint uh, and in, in the long term, this entire country in terms of, you know, whether it's water quality, whether it's kids' health, uh, perspective is key. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There is, um, you know, another uh, approach that some cities have used like um, you know the healthy people movement in order to improve health like the healthy people 2020 and then cities like Baltimore have the healthy people uh, Baltimore which is really more of a, a shorter plan I think even thinking together you know working together on an action plan around health helps which goes back to listening being honest and being open to hearing what uh, each partner wants and needs in order for health to happen. Yeah. I would like to make a comment, um, uh, particularly to, to a couple comments that Siddhartha made. Um, this is a crisis, but again, you're right, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right now around the country, you have citizens who are now questioning their public water supply. Right. Okay. And, you know, Flint is in the spotlight, but there are other cities and towns out there that are experiencing, uh, might not be experiencing uh, land issues, but there are other contaminants that are out there. And they're speaking up, and they want to know what's going on. And so it's been an opportunity for citizens to, to question uh, and to make sure that the, the authorities are, are doing what they need to do to provide them with uh, health and, and safe drinking water. Um, in respect to the scientific process, it's a long haul. Really, you know, we have uh, the Virginia Tech research team, but also uh, the US EPA that's going in and, and, and doing a robust sampling approach to just kind of understand, really, source identification. Are there any other leakages or contaminants in the system? Uh, and continual monitoring that will have to happen uh, in the long term to make sure whatever treatments that are being implemented are effective. Because the goal is to make sure that the residents have a safe drinking water supply. So, you know, it really, it's a long, it's a long haul and a long process. Um, and one that's going to take uh, various stakeholders, whether it be the citizens or the researchers or the agencies or the larger oversight agencies to come together to make sure that, you know, this, this, this doesn't happen in another city or town. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking to rebuilding trust and partnership and robust sampling, you know, I'm really happy to see that in this Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee that Dr. Edwards and by, way, and by way of him, your group is still participating in the long haul, right? The coming up with a long-term solution for these problems. I think you're absolutely right, Melanie, that these things have to be addressed in a, in a systematic way that encompasses all of the variables that are, that are at play. Um, so really happy to see that your team is a member of that. Um, going back to the, the trust issue, um, I appreciated the community speaking back again and being like, no, we don't want to use whatever organ organization the, the, the authorities have chosen. We would like our friends, Dr. Edwards and his whole Virginia Tech crew. So that, um, I think, already is, is a, a, a mechanism of listening and, and taking the, the opinions of the community. So I'm really happy to see that and to hear that you all are part of the long-term solution. Um, and I did also want to underscore again this notion that like it is not it is not the case that because this has happened nothing else good can happen for Flint or nothing else wonderful can come out of Flint and it's important for us not to frame it in that way. These are still these are an incredibly resilient group of individuals who have 
worked to make this local story a national story and have pulled in experts from across the country and done some extensive research testing to make this happen, right? This is a vibrant community full of brilliant people who are multi-talented and engaged on many different levels. And so we aren't just talking about um, a horrible thing and, and, and we are talking about something horrible, but there is still good there and there's still light there and there's still incredible human beings there. So I think your, your point about perspective is very important. Um, speaking of the long haul, you know, all, it's been all over the news that celebrities and, and communities all over the country are sending bottles of water. Right, they're sending water, um, but we also know that some of the some of the effects of lead can be mitigated by healthy nutrition and you know taking certain medication not medications uh, vitamins and minerals and things like that. Right, so there's a dietetic component that can be helpful. So in the over the long term, how can we engage the community beyond bottles of water? Is that the best thing to do right now? Are there other things we can be doing? Um, to, to help with the situation? You know, in terms of bottled water, uh, we cannot say uh, peop to people that they should directly drink water from the tap unless we know it is safe. Uh, once we get to a point where, according to the lead and copper rules, sampling, we meet the standard, you know, to be honest, I don't think people are going to drink tap water even then uh, because of the, you know, they're widely, they're very mistrustful, so it might take a long time. But uh, was your question about just water or nutrition as a whole? Both, both. You know, I know that people are sending water now, and that is the nature of having the spotlight of public attention. I'm wondering if, if the drive should be to continue to be sending water to Flint over time, even when it's not the headline story, or if there are other things we should also be sending or doing to, to help Cause, I mean, because it's it's not necessarily feasible for people to, for example, rebuild the piping, right, the, the municipal piping. So what is it that people can be doing to help? Um, I can answer the water question uh, because I'm an engineer. Uh, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. Definitely uh, the state, the, all the federal money that is coming in, part of it should be invested in trying to make sure people have filters for the next as long as it takes for people to say, okay, now I'm ready to trust my tap water again. Uh, bottled water is not sustainable, but it's necessary in the short term because uh, you know the health of our families is a lot, a lot more important than some plastic. I, I see the environmental issue here, but I think we, we can all agree on that. Trying to make sure our kids are getting safe water is a lot more important than the amount of plastic that we're generating. So as uh, the time it takes for us to get back to uh, live, safe lead levels or levels as less lead as possible uh, in the water uh, would be good. Uh, and as Spotlight dies away from this problem, um, the, the city and the state and all the federal money that is coming in should definitely be invested in not just filters and in all these mechanisms, but replacing the pipes in the long term. Mm -hmm. Somebody can answer the nutrition question. <laughs> You know, from the nutrition stance, I think it goes back to thinking about what the families want and need and then looking at those issues as well. And then also looking at the preventable diseases as it relates to chronic disease in that region. Because while the lead um, has given us another story and another opportunity, but looking at um, other, you know, diseases in terms of death rates and and even illness as it relates to things that are preventable, um, you know, through diet and exercise might be another stepping stone after they start addressing this problem, you know, because a lot of times communities want to say, okay, this is our immediate need. And then while we're listening to them, ask them what they want to address next would, would shed light on what we should do you know, as a, as a country next to help this community because they are resilient, they are smart, and they know exactly where they want to go next. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, have, I have one more question. I know we're, I'm not going to use more time. Um, but I had one more question, and maybe I'll ask it to Melanie uh, before we wrap up. So, so Dartha mentioned the point about the filters, and the filters are extremely important, but I remember reading that the, the lead levels right now are so high that the filters aren't really working. So I wondered if you could talk 
just from sort of a water quality perspective of how how the filter works and what it means that those filters are failing um, and what needs to happen. To, well, we know that the water needs to be higher quality, but if you could talk a little bit about that. So, yes, there, there are various filters that can be used to treat a number of, um, to filter a number of, of chemicals or contaminants uh, in drinking water uh, from the very microscopic level to, to particle size. And so um, I believe they're, they're using filters that have a limit, and Siddhartha, I, I'd want you to um, confirm, that have a limit of a 150 parts per billion. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, that is what I've heard. I, I haven't read the news report myself. But I can add a little bit to that in that mm -hmm. we, we realized the concerns and we tested some of the filtering mechanisms in our lab uh, when the news came out. Uh, so to take Leanne's example, one of the highest lead samples that she had was 13,000. And we ran it through a filter and it came back 20, 2, 0. So, you know, something as high as 13,000 is being filtered. It's not perfect, but if you compare what was before and what is after, lead levels have come down dramatically. So uh, while it is not perfect, it is one of the cheapest and best mechanisms to use, of course, besides bottled water. I would urge people to still continue using the filters, despite what you've heard in the media for now. Okay. And I would add that, you know, the filters are really a testing mechanism. They're, they're not typically, they're not used so that the residents can then continue to use the water. Right, it's a testing mechanism, and so you know, once we know what's actually there, um, and over a, a given threshold, then it becomes a mute point, right? And so, uh, it's it's important to note that. Absolutely. Well, I am beyond thankful to have the three of you here uh, this evening to discuss this issue, to really highlight and underscore uh, the resilience, commitment, brilliance, and just all around awesomeness of the residents of Flint. Uh, thank you, Siddhartha, for representing your research lab and for the incredible amount of open science and citizen science that you all did. You have clearly become the standard bearer and the, the sort of benchmark for what good open science is, uh, what science for social justice looks like. Um, and there is so much more conversation around that point that we are looking forward to having with you and your group as experts, but also in the larger scientific community for how we can be more engaged, more community engaged, as you say, um, Dr. Balsberry, and have more engagement with that uh, and, and to raise a more active citizenry in science across the country, as you mentioned, Dr. Harrison Okoro. Um, and, and have this really ripple um, less in effect but more in interest and activity level. So I am extremely thankful to have you here on the show. Thank you for your time and for sharing excuse me, with our community uh, your wisdom, your expertise, and your, your thoughts. Uh, they have been thought-provoking and just a joy to, 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 to process through all of this with you. Um, I also need to thank Dr. Danielle Lee, who uh, helped me get in touch with you, Dr. Shabaka, who helped me find you, Dr. Harris Nakoro, and who helped me find you, Dr. Balsberry, right? So you all are all sort of um, in the network of people um, that was found by her, and she helped me think through the show, so I want to give a huge thank to her, Dr. Kerrigan Bondar, um, and also to Lana M. R. Hunter, who helped me put the actual show together, as you all know. Um, so I really want to thank you for having this conversation about the Flint water crisis. It is an ongoing story. The, the, the citizens are continuing to act. Um, some of, some interventions are being ha had on, in that community. Uh, so we'll certainly be talking about this for for quite some time to come. But I'm very happy that we have, have had this conversation. So thank you for joining me on this show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining. If you want to have more conversation with us, you can be come to our Facebook group, Vanguard Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. We'll be on Twitter at Vanguard STEM or hashtag Vanguard STEM. Uh, so the conversation is ongoing. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night.